Let's pray. Lord, truly you are peerless. There is no one like you. And that you would call us to be associated with you, to have your name on our lips, that you might write our names on your own heart. Staggering. When we think about the depths of our own sin and the infinite heights of your holiness, your otherness, your beauty, and your perfections, and that you have bridged, bridged an infinite gap by your love, by your mercies, to bring us to yourself, we are in awe. Thank you for these words and this music. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to sit under your word tonight. We pray that you would work in us as you will. You are our God. In Jesus' name, amen. Matt, you can um, sit in my car and sing that on the way home. That'd be great. <laughs> Set up my week for worship. I hope I brought my eyeballs. Yes. We're going to begin our time tonight by reading the text we'll study together. So turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 6. We'll read verses 1 through 15. It seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom, that they would be in charge of the whole kingdom, and over them three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one, that these satraps might be accountable to them, and that the king might not suffer loss. Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps, because he possessed an extraordinary spirit, and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Then the commissioners and satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs, but they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption, inasmuch as he was faithful, and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Then these men said, we will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. Then these commissioners and satraps came by agreement to the king and spoke to him as follows, King Darius, live forever. All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects, the satraps, the high officials, and the governors have consulted together that the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man beside you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document, that is, the injunction. Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now, in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God, as he had been doing previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. Then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Did you not sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days is to be cast into the lion's den? The king replied, the statement is true according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which may not be revoked. Then they answered and spoke before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you signed, but keeps making his petition three times a day. Then as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel. And even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Recognize, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or statute which the king establishes may be changed. We are looking this evening at the first half of what is perhaps the best known story in the Bible. This is a, a well-known narrative. People who have never opened a Bible know this story, no reference of this story, Daniel in the lion's den. There is a danger of familiarity for us, so I toyed with some alternate titles just to keep us on our toes. 
maybe we could have called tonight's sermon cat food. Or maybe it's the trap. <laughs> Daniel was trapped by the satraps. Yeah. Or maybe lion in wait. <laughs> the conspirators were lying to the king while lying in wait for Daniel's position, but the lions were waiting for lunch. Or maybe let us pray. <laughs> Daniel's enemies prey upon him. Daniel prays and the lions prey upon whoever gets thrown into the pit. I could keep going, but I would really need Ken Evans. If you've ever emailed Ken Evans, you know that pun and Ken are in his email address. Maybe it's punk Ken. I don't know. You can take your pick on that. But the title for tonight's message is none of those things. It's not a pun. It's not clever. It's just Daniel to the Den of Lions, part one. That's the title. There's a danger with familiarity with what we're about to walk through. It, it could cause us to dismiss what's important or to miss what is shocking, to fail to put ourselves in Daniel's shoes and to feel what he himself would have felt in this situation. So I ask you this evening to pretend you have never heard this story before. And we're going to observe the setup to Daniel's death sentence this evening as we walk really through the first half of the story. And we're going to see the setup to Daniel's death sentence in five scenes. The first scene is simply life under new administration. Life under new administration. And, and it begins in verse 1, and, and really it ought to begin in chapter 5, verse 30. Go back a couple verses to the previous episode. The same night Belshazzar the Chaldean or Babylonian was slain. That is the end of the mighty Babylonian empire. Verse 31, so Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. So here we have a new character that steps onto the scene and a new empire on the scene. We remember from Daniel's vision in chapter 2 that there would be the Babylonians and then the Medo-Persians, followed by the Greeks and the Romans and Rome part 2. That's all coming. But here we are, the end of the Babylonian empire, the beginning of the Persian empire, which is a Medo-Persian empire. Cyrus, the, the ruler of the Persian empire, made a habit of incorporating foreign dignitaries into his administration. And as having conquered a significant part of the land, which was the Median Empire, he joined forces with them. It truly was the Medes and the Persians that took over at this time. And Darius, sorry, I wasn't going to say that. It's Darius. I checked the Hebrew pronunciation. Darius, Darius, Darius. Uh, Darius is put in charge of Babylon proper, the city of Babylon, and over the region surrounding the city of Babylon under Cyrus, who is overseeing the entirety of the empire. We have here a new administration, and we have Daniel in this administration, who at this point in the story is older than any man in our church. And that's remarkable to think about. I don't, I don't know if you grew up with Daniel in the lion's den, the story of the teenage boy thrown to the lions and he had courage. He wasn't a teenager at this point. Uh, he was in his 80s. And there's been much made of this character Darius. Who is he? There's not a Darius in the ancient secular histories of the time. And so three options have been given for his identity. Perhaps Darius is another name for Cyrus. I don't believe that works because Cyrus wasn't Median, he was Persian, and he's a distinct character from Darius. Look down at chapter 6, verse 28. So Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And in order to make them the same character, you have to take verse 28 as saying, in the reign of Darius, even the reign of Cyrus. That's a grammatical possibility. I believe that's remote. I think there are two distinct characters for that and for other reasons. The second possibility is that uh, Darius is Cyrus's son, Camses, but he's too young, doesn't fit the 62-year-old that's in this passage. And I'm only giving you the options, by the way, of those who believe that the Bible is true. There are lots of other options that people give uh, who are just ridiculous suggestions. 
And the third option is that put forward by John Whitcomb of a, the governor of Babylon placed there by Cyrus who served there for 16 years. It fits everything in the narrative of Daniel. And his name was Gubaru. Rhymes with Subaru. And Gubaru was the governor of Babylon placed by Cyrus to be king over the region that was formerly the Babylonian Empire. So that would be Babylon City and the district that had belonged to the Babylonian Empire, now it's been overrun and is ruled by the Medo-Persians, which is much bigger, includes the Babylonian Empire, but extends to much more territory. The Persian Empire, in fact, is the largest empire in world history at this point. And so Cyrus would have set up Gubaru or Darius the Mede to rule under him in Babylon. That is my, uh, that is my take on the identity of Darius. We need to disambiguate Darius here just a little bit. He's not the same Darius as the Darius in Ezra 6. The Darius in Ezra 6, who oversees the rebuilding of the temple after people have already gone back from exile, is a generation after Cyrus. And he actually goes back into the archives and finds Cyrus's letter that approves and funds the return and the rebuilding of the temple. And then there's some conflict there. You can read about him in the book of Ezra. That's a different Darius. So don't confuse the Darius from Daniel 6 with the Darius of Ezra 6. In fact, Darius could very well have been a title for someone who is regent, sort of like Caesar. There was a Caesar Augustus, and then everybody else after him gets just called Caesar or Kaiser or all the rest down through European history. It becomes a title. It's very likely that Darius became a title or was a title from the beginning uh, in fact, there are a number of Darius the kings in subsequent ancient Near Eastern history. So Darius is overseeing a new administration. He's 62, year old, 62 years old when he begins. Is this new administration going to be better? Well, I think we discover here a better king, but a bitter bureaucracy. Uh, this is going to be good and bad for Daniel. Darius set over the region 120 satraps. You see that in verse 1. A satrap is just a Persian word. The Persian word is satrap, and it comes over into the English as satrap because we didn't really have a good replacement for that. And it means some sort of a regional leader, someone subservient to the king but higher up in the administration. And these 120 satraps would be roaming satraps. There were times in the Persian Empire where you had satrapies, that is a, an area governed by one satrap, but these seem to be roaming satraps to fill the kingdom. And this would be important at a time of transition of power. The Babylonian Empire and all of its middle management and administration is going away, and Darius needs to make sure the empire runs well and his segment of governing runs well, so he assigns 120 satraps to fill the kingdom. In addition to the 120 satraps, we have three commissioners, verse 2. These are presidents, or maybe a good translation of this word is chiefs. They are heads in the administration. They keep the satraps accountable. And what is this accountability for? Verse 2, that the king might not suffer loss. And here in this new administration, Daniel's abilities are recognized. Look at verse 3. This Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners, that is the three chiefs, and the satraps, the 120, because he possessed an extraordinary spirit, and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. So we're going to go from 120 and three chiefs to 120, three chiefs, and one of those chiefs is the chief chief overseeing the whole kingdom. Daniel's abilities were recognized here. Of course, he had been trained under Nebuchadnezzar. He had 60 years of statecraft experience. He had natural gifts and supernatural giftings. He was wiser than his teachers as a teen. He was an expert in God's Word. He was a writer of God's Word. He was a believer of God's Word. That sets him head and shoulders above everybody else with a lesser worldview. And now he is some 80 years old. He has a seasoned faith in Yahweh. He has seen two empires and seven administrations. And he also has already seen God's program for human governments to the very end of human history. This man is as well equipped to serve in the social services, in civil service, as anybody who has ever been in a government position. And Darius wants to put the whole kingdom under him. And Daniel's abilities and his integrity are a threat 
to the ambitious civil servants with poorer gifts, greedy hearts, and no scruples. You're aware, I am sure, of government waste. When I was in high school, I read the articles about how much a toilet seat on a C-130 cost. Astronomically, tens of thousands of dollars. Why? Because every mental management official is lining his pocket with the proceeds that come down the pike through a government contract. This is the way governments work. Governments are necessary and wasteful. And all the people that are involved themselves with government tend to line their pockets, curry favor, skim from the taxation. In such a scenario, Daniel's integrity and his very presence would be an irritant. They were, of course, jealous of his abilities. Daniel would advance before they would. They were concerned about his integrity. We can't cheat and skim and line our pockets with this guy around. And they were concerned for his work ethic. We can't be slouches if he's over us. We can't be slouches even if he's in the same room. Laziness is threatened by a good work ethic, just by comparison. I was in the international airport in the Ukraine a number of years ago and watched bricklayers And of course, we had several hours to kill in this airport because the time it took for the bags to come from the airplane to the baggage retrieval room uh, was somewhere around three and a half to four hours. So naturally, we, we had time to watch the building of a brick wall. And in the span of three and a half to four hours, we saw two bricklayers working at this little pony wall. It was about 10 feet long and yay high. And in that span, they successfully delivered two bricks in two separate deliveries. The the two workmen were carrying a board, and on the board was a brick. And they slowly meandered behind some wall to wherever the bricks were. Took a lunch break, smoke break, another lunch break. Talked about how great communism is. And then carried the board back in with the lone brick and set it down by a pile of bricks that was obviously intended to build this pony wall. And then they went with that board back around the corner again. I wonder what those guys are doing. Another smoke break, more conversations about what, what great incentives are given under communism to work hard. And then they brought back another brick on that board and set it down by the pile. And they were dressed fully as masons, bricklayers. They were tasked to build this wall. Could you imagine what it would be like if someone came in and built a pony wall in half a day? That's a threat. That's an indictment. It's an exposure. Daniel is just such an exposure, an indictment by his very presence in the administration of the Persian Empire. Notice verse 4. Then the commissioners and the satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. This is, this is pretty remarkable. They, they go to the realm in which he is eminently successful and they start trying to find some area of negligence, some area of corruption perhaps. Is there anything we can throw mud at that will stick? Some accusation. And the irony in this In doing this very thing, looking for some negligence or corruption in Daniel and government work, they themselves are accusable, right? They're neglecting their own government work, wasting time trying to find this. And they're corrupt because they don't have any ground of accusation and they're lobbying for accusations. They are negligent and corrupt and that's the very thing they're trying to accuse Daniel of. And of course, there's nothing to find. This is deep state investigation, I mean, imagine the investigative alphabet at their disposal, the FBI, the CIA, the Secret Service, Department of Homeland Security, OSHA, get the press corps involved. They had all the resources at their disposal to find something on the guy. Not a trace. And the more they looked at Daniel's life, what would they find? Efficiency, hard work, Effective leadership, integrity, actual protection of the king's resources. 
And at some point, you just have to call off the investigation because the more we investigate, the worse we look by comparison. Hey, let's go look at that pony wall that really uh, fast bricklayer is laying and see if we can find some crack in the wall, some missing brick, some missed process. All the while, they're standing there with no wall and a pile of two bricks. It's just shameful. They're just embarrassed by the investigation. They have to go somewhere else. And listen, they have assumed corruption by projection, right? They are assuming in Daniel's character what they know to be true about their own. And they're surprised that Daniel, with all of his gifts and all of his access, is not taking advantage of his position in the way that they did, in the ways that they would. The next scene here is the implementation of adversarial legislation. That says number three in my notes. What number are you on? Are you on number two? I feel like I left something out. My numbers are just wrong. We're going to go with number two, the implementation of adversarial legislation. Uh, in other words, they, they're putting in place really bad rules. And, and, and they're not just bad because they're nonsensical. They are adversarial. Uh, they have animosity towards Daniel, and they want to try to get him by a pernicious, hostile, antagonistic law. Look at verse 5. These men then said, we will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. So we have here the, the genesis of this terrible legislation. The enemies observed Daniel's uncompromising devotion to God. So Daniel's reputation for unflinching worship of Yahweh actually becomes the end that they need. We can't get him on any government work. We can't get him on negligence. We can't get him on corruption. What will we get him on? We have to get him somewhere where he won't flinch. We've got to trap him. Where will that be? Well, at the very spot Daniel is known for so eminently, devotion to Yahweh. And we have to ask, does our reputation go that far? Would people know that the, that the way they could get us is in an unswerving devotion to Christ. So that leads from the genesis of their plot to outright collusion in verse 6. Then these commissioners and satraps came by agreement to the king and spoke to him as follows, King Darius, live forever. Came by agreement is a word that means to be in tumult, uh, to, to be agitated as a mob. It is possible that it came to, to mean just arriving together at agreement, but, but I'm, I'm convinced that it still has some of the violent flavor in it. It carries some of the flavor of, of an angry agreement together, those who are mobbishly aligned against a common enemy. This is antagonistic collusion, and this word shows up three times in this text, and it carries with it this adversarial stance where these enemies have come together against a common enemy. This is the word that's used in Psalm 2, that the nations are said to rage against God together. The same word. Notice in verse 6, commissioners is plural, chiefs. How many did we have? Three. So you take Daniel out, how many do you have left? Two. That's still plural. That means all of Daniel's peer-level colleagues have aligned themselves together against him. Jesus said in John 15, 19, the world hates you. Here it seems the world has aligned itself against God's faithful representative in Daniel. There is next the lie that comes about in verse 7. All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the high officials and the governors, have consulted together. Well, that's not true. It's not likely that all of the 120 satraps who were supposed to be roaming about the kingdom, keep, keeping things in, in check, would all be there, that they all would have agreed to this. But this is absolutely a lie because they didn't consult with Daniel, and he's one of them. They are clearly misrepresenting the case before the king. 
Even the, the introduction that's given in verse 6, it's, it's appropriate in the king's throne room to say such things. King Darius lived forever, but they didn't mean that. They're not out for his welfare. And so then the law comes in the second half of verse 7. The king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction. That is, he should write a law and then he should strengthen it that anyone who, who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. So this is going to be a federal injunction, a, a binding statute that Darius himself would write and strengthen, that is, bring about all the strength of enforcement, and it is a prohibition of petitioning anyone besides him, and, and specifically petitioning in a religious context. Uh, this is not, you can't go next door and ask your buddy for a cup of, of sugar. Um, that's not what's prohibited here. Most likely what's in mind is Darius would be the go-between, the mediator between gods and men. And that you, for 30 days, not go to a priest, not make a petition directly to any god, but, but all religious petitions must go through King Darius. That's the rule. He would replace the priestly class. He would represent the pantheon of deities on the earth before men. This would solidify loyalty of the empire in this transition period. It would unify the region under his leadership. It would be a test of loyalty for all the varied peoples that are now under his governance. And it is armed with the teeth of capital offense. If you don't do this. If you violate this, you will be executed. You'll be killed. Now, as a kid, I had a visceral fear of being eaten while conscious by a land predator. I don't know what that phobia is called, but I had it. Uh, you may remember uh, Gary Larson's uh, Far Side comic strip where he described lupo slipophobia. That's the fear of being pursued by timber wolves around a kitchen table while wearing socks on a newly waxed floor. I, I had a very specific phobia that a land animal was going to eat me while I was still alive, and I would remain conscious through the entire process. In fact, I had dreams about this where I just couldn't die. I wanted to give up, and I'm still aware that I'm being gnawed upon. Probably didn't help that I grew up in Alaska, and I read the book Alaska Bear Tales by Larry Caniot, where he describes in detail the maulings by grizzly bears of hunters and fishermen, campers. Years ago, I read the account of the Tsabo lions. You know, those are the lions made famous by the Val Kilmer movie, Ghost in the Darkness. These were two African lions that actually hunted together, it seems, for sport, stopped the sort of transcontinental railroad that was taking the, the depravity of European civilization and the light of the gospel simultaneously across the heart of Africa. And these two man-killer lions would shred railroad workers, pull them out of their tents and rip them apart and pile their carcasses and piles of bones in their cave. I mean, just terrifying stuff. I don't know why I'm even telling you this right now. You're going to have nightmares. And maybe that's just fair because I grew up with those very nightmares. Just a terrifying thought. And, and, and I don't know that we have taken the time to think about what this threat would have been like for Daniel. Have you thought about being ripped apart while conscious by wild animals? I think we need to. This is our opportunity tonight. It's in the text. And we've encountered a number of remarkable methods of punitive demise in this book already. Torn limb from limb, thrown into a fiery furnace. But for me, this one's the worst. Dropped into a pit of lions. It is known that the Persians kept animals like lions and tigers in pits. They were either caves that were added a, a fourth wall to a three-walled opening, and there would be a door. Oftentimes, there was a, a walled space between two uh, compartments so that the lions could be on one side, and the one who cares for the lions, the, the worker who feeds them, hopefully doesn't get fed to them, uh, can uh, put them in one compartment, and then clean up their pen. And they kept these lions for sport, to hunt them for fun, um, or to use them to kill violators of capital decrees. 
So then the pressure is squeezed, verse 8. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document. Listen, these people are telling the king what to do. And, and literally, it, they're not uh, imperatives in the original. It is just, you will establish the decree, and you will sign the writing. You can feel the pressure being put on here, and they are giving the, the king orders about what to do. And remember from verse 6, they've, they've already said that everybody's in agreement. Look, this is bipartisan res, uh, um, legislation, uh, maybe not even partisan at all. Every government official agrees that you must be the sole mediator between your people and the gods. And then King Darius is the dupe. Verse 9, he falls for it. Therefore, King Darius signed the document that is the injunction. And, and this decree comes with the Medo-Persian tradition that once the king signs the thing, the king himself can't unsign it. It's sort of inviolable at that point. And I believe that probably comes from the Persian doctrine of kings don't make mistakes. In fact, we find out later Persian kings signed the death warrants of innocent men and immediately regretted it but couldn't do anything about it. Killed the guy anyway. And we discover this same strict approach elsewhere in the scriptures. Ezra uh, describes this same principle of the laws of the Medes and Persians being inviolable. And the king is duped by the flattery here. Therefore, King Darius signed the document, that is the injunction. Listen, they appealed to his vanity. They appealed to his self-importance. Perhaps they appealed to the political necessity of unifying the empire. But the, the text seems pretty clear that, that what they put before him was just this idea that he would be really, really important as the go-between, the only one that people could come to to make a prayer petition. Now, that would go to your head. It certainly went to Darius's. Next scene is the courageous consistency of Daniel. The courageous consistency of Daniel. This is verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now, in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem, and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God, as he had been doing previously. Daniel went home and defied the king's order. When did he do this? As soon as he heard the edict was signed. Where did he do this? To his upper room. The upper room on top of his house was a place of solitude. It would have had lattice windows that allowed open ventilation. It would be a place you could go and be by yourself. But the fact that it was open for ventilation meant it could be open for visibility as well. And windows were open, the text tells us, toward Jerusalem. That's where Daniel went home and defied the king's order. How did he do this? Kneeling on his knees. The Bible doesn't tell us whether or not Daniel played high school football. But 80-year-old knees are problematic. This was not a comfortable posture for prayer. It's not the only posture for prayer given in the scriptures. But here Daniel is on his knees. And apparently this was customary, not a new posture for Daniel. Daniel is demonstrating submission to God. Remember his name means God is my judge. God is not being told what to do in Daniel's prayer. Oh God, you got to get me out of this. Daniel is on his knees before the king of kings. He is an undeserving sinner at the throne of grace. Daniel is on his knees, kneeling in submission to the Lord. How often did, was Daniel doing this? Three times a day, as always. Notice in the verse here, verse 10, that he continued this was regular practice for Daniel, as he had been doing previously, the end of verse 10 tells us. And what was he praying? Well, he was kneeling on his knees, praying, that is, making petitions, direct violation of the king's edict, expressing dependence on the Lord and asking for help, and giving thanks. That's kind of surprising. Would love to be a fly on the wall and listen to that prayer. Why was Daniel doing this so visibly? I mean, why, why, why couldn't he pray downstairs with the windows closed? 
There are a couple of reasons that Daniel could not, I believe, pray in secret and be rewarded in secret. Number one, he was intentionally not changing his previous pattern. Daniel here is not ostentatious. He's not rebellious for rebellion's sake. He's not sticking it to the man. He's just doing what he's always done. And, and this was actually important for Daniel. This was humble, patterned obedience. I want you to turn in your Bible to 1 Kings chapter 8. This is a testimony to Daniel's obedience, his faithfulness. It's also a testimony to Daniel's clinging to God's word while in exile. Daniel would have had to know his Bible to be doing what he was doing here. 1 Kings 8, of course, is Solomon's public prayer. Here's a king confessing the fact that God alone is king at the dedication of the temple. Effectively, I've built this little box for you, and the heavens and the highest heavens can't contain you. How much less this tiny little box? That's Solomon's perspective on the temple. Look what he says as Solomon leads the people to worship God at the dedication of the temple. This is prophetic. Verse 46. When they sin against you, this is, again, Solomon's public prayer. All Israel is hearing this as they're assembled. When they sin against you, for there's no man who does not sin, and you are angry with them, and deliver them to an enemy, so that they take them away captive to the land of the enemy, far off or near... If they take thought in the land where they've been taken captive and repent and make supplication to you in the land of those who have taken them captive, saying, we have sinned, we have committed iniquity, we have acted wickedly. If they return to you with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies who have taken them captive, and they pray to you, listen to this, toward their land which you have given to their fathers, the city which you have chosen, and the house which I've built for your name, then hear their prayer and their supplication in heaven, your dwelling place, and maintain their cause. Forgive your people who have sinned against you and all their transgressions which they have transgressed against you and make them objects of compassion before those who have taken them captive that they may have compassion on them. Facing Jerusalem, opening the windows of the upper room towards Jerusalem and praying visibly, regularly, It's not some superstition. It's not some practice as if, well, God lives in in that temple that's now been demolished to the ground. No, God lives in heaven. Solomon knew that when he built the building. And it's still true when the building got torn down. But Jerusalem was the place where God chose to set his affections on his people and manifest his presence where his people would gather together to give testimony that there is only one God and it is our God, the God of Israel. It is Yahweh. Daniel here is obeying the injunction that Solomon prayed at the dedication of the temple. He's doing the very thing that would be a measure of obedience. This is not ostentatious. This is not bragging. Everybody look at me. I'm praying. But Daniel actually is leading the people, the exiles, in captivity to what they should be doing in their heart posture towards the Lord. We know from Daniel chapter 9 that he also had the book of Jeremiah in his hands while in exile. Listen to Jeremiah 29, verse 7. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to Yahweh on its behalf, for in its welfare you will have welfare. Down at verse 10, thus says Yahweh, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place, Jerusalem, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares Yahweh, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Jeremiah's prophecy concerning the exiles in Babylon is very specific, and it gives hope to the people. And Daniel here is obeying Solomon's injunction from 1 Kings 8 and clinging to the promises of Jeremiah 29, 7, 10, and 11. And he's doing so as a prophet of God, as a leader of God's people as they're in exile, and he is doing so from the heartbeat of homesickness. 
And, and by that, I don't mean, well, you know, when Daniel was 12, he really loved being in Jerusalem because things were really going well there. <laughs> Daniel was probably living a lot more comfortable life in Babylon. His homesickness was a theological homesickness from the lap of luxury to the place of God's affections for his people and his keeping of covenant promises. Daniel's prayer here in the upper chamber is rich. This is a prayer of longing and expectation. So if Daniel were to stop at the injunction of the king, this would be to change from visible devotion to Yahweh and the leadership of the people to some hidden devotion, to cringe under sinful fear. To, it, this would have a, a, a deleterious effect on the exiles. This would be compromise for Daniel. It would be disobedience to 1 Kings 8 and a, and a dissing of the promises of Jeremiah 29. It would be sending the message, I serve God only when it's convenient or allowed, not when it's costly. Look, there is a readily apparent danger for Daniel. There's a pit of lions and they're hungry. But there's a not so apparent danger for Daniel and it's worse. Compromise, fear of man, capitulation, spiritual cowardice. These are all far more dangerous for Daniel and for the exiles than a pit of lions. Daniel was not worshiping at the idol of safety. Daniel knew that a lasting testimony was more important than lasting safety. So Daniel went home deliberately, as was his pattern, to trust God, to pray for the land of Babylon, right? That, that's exactly what Jeremiah said to do. Pray for the welfare of Babylon. To long for the fulfillment of God's promises, to lead the exiles by example, to give thanks, to submit to his king, to worship the king of all kings one last time. To pray, to meet the lions, and go home. It's courageous consistency. The next scene is the conspirator's trap, beginning in verse 11. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. There's that word again, they came by agreement. That's that antagonistic collusion. And you have to think, guys, don't you have some satrapping to do somewhere? I mean, shouldn't you be busy about something else than, than conjuring up these laws and then sneaking around Daniel's apartment and peering in the upper room through the lattice windows and go, aha, there he is, he's doing it. They're here obviously to trap Daniel. And they're here to trap Darius. They caught Daniel in the act of imperial subterfuge, apparently. He's clearly a threat to the Persian Empire up there in his room all alone. <laughs> he's a threat to Darius's authority up there. He's a threat to the very well-being of the city of Babylon because he's praying for its welfare. Um, he's all alone in his upper chamber. He, he may very well even be praying for his colleagues, the conspirators. So they rush in, verse 12. They approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Didn't you sign the injunction? They got to remind the king about this new law. Maybe they're double checking to make sure the ink was dry on the bill. They want to make sure that it, everything's been properly enacted and signed and sealed. And the king affirms the law and its irrevocability. And the conspirators here are on solid legal ground now. They can now take the next step that they need toward the elimination of Daniel the enemy. And they give their report to the king of Daniel's crimes in verse 13. They answered and spoke before the king, Daniel, one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you sign, and he keeps making his petition three times a day. Their report of Daniel's crimes is the worst way to describe what he's doing possible. It's racially motivated, he's hostile to the empire, and this is habitual. Right? He's one of the Jews from the exile. He's not from around here, so he can't be loyal to you. He's hostile to you, O king, your reputation, and to your law. This is a huge diss, and it's habitual. It, it, we didn't just see him doing this once. He, he does this three times a day. He does it every day. He keeps on doing it. This isn't a slip or a mistake. He is intentionally, consistently defying the king. Now, I'm not convinced they stuck around past noon to see whether he prayed at the third time. I, I think as soon as they had the first spot of evidence, they ran into the king. 
Politically here, they could not be in a better position. Murder with legal cover and imperial power. And of course, they have cast Daniel's upright actions in the worst possible light. Spoiler alert, they're going to fall into their own trap. Verse 14 gives us the final scene here, the grief of the king. Verse 14, as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed. He set his mind on delivering Daniel. Even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. Literally, then, verse 14, it was a great bad upon him when the king heard the thing. This was a bad on the king. Serious grief. Notice the king is not mad at Daniel. How could that guy defy my orders? No, immediately the veil's been pulled off on this conspiracy. He's mad at himself, most likely. He's certainly upset at the conspirators. We'll find out uh, that more in detail next week. These same dudes that pushed through the legislation are the same dudes that spied on Daniel praying at his home, and they're the same guys that in haste reported it to the king. At this point, the king knows that he has been duped, trapped, made an implement of conspiracy and murder, and he does not like it. He has fallen for their flattery and their scheming, and now his most loyal and gifted civil servant is done for. What's left of his government after Daniel is gone? Greedy cheaters and schemers who will do anything to get ahead. They'll even lie to the king and trap the king and tell the king what to do. That does not bode well for the empire, just at a practical level, no matter his affections for Daniel himself. So he sought to release Daniel. Apparently, in the Medo-Persian law, the sentence was to be executed quickly, the same day. He only had till sundown to try to work this out. No doubt he's talking with his lawyers. He's trying to come up with every realm of appeal, what can be done here, uh, until literally the going in of the sun. And then the conspirators press in verse 15 for the execution of the edict, the execution of Daniel. Uh, they just kind of twist the dagger in the king a little bit. Recognize, O king, it is a law of the Medes and Persians. Once you signed it, that's it. What is this story all about? I know we're just telling half of the story. Let me back up and sermonize a little bit, if I can. Um, this story is perhaps about how to navigate life under irrational governments, under inconsistent rulings, duplicitous mandates, antagonistic regulation, punitive stipulations designed to suppress people who actually do what's right. Here we have a dumb law. The guy who wrote it and signed it was duped into writing it and signing it. If he had only seen the motives behind it or the results of it, he would never have enacted it. And this was done in a land where such an act, once put in place, was bigger than the king. No appeal possible. And Daniel, the innocent party, in fact, the one government official who was not corrupt in the crosshairs of government corruption and a personal vendetta. Corrupt government officials plotted the murder of the non-corrupt by corruption and collusion at the highest levels. This is deep state conspiracy to bury their own laziness and greed by burying the one good guy. Now listen, God's people will get caught up in such corruption. Innocent parties to the machinations and schemings of people in power behind the scenes. The Jews throughout history are a classic example. You remember John the Baptist? You would love for John the Baptist to go down in the middle of a sermon. And he doesn't. He gets his head on a platter over a silly, untimely, drunken promise. Jesus, of course, a victim of such corruption. A victim, I give you air quotes on the word victim. He was innocent in the corruption that brought about a sham trial and his murder. But he was also the one bringing all those events about for our salvation. And the church history is replete with believers who trusted God, who were hapless victims of the machinations of changing governments, fickle laws, personal vendettas. In the time of the Huguenots, 
French Catholics were told they could have the stuff of French Protestants if they just turned them in and accused them of rebellion against the government. Free stuff, turn in your neighbor. Christians sometimes have to wait to be delivered. And sometimes Christians wait and are not delivered and have to wait until God makes it right at the very end. All right, second sermon. Maybe this is a passage about how to navigate a volatile workplace. What is it like to be a hard worker? To have a good work ethic? To not be lazy? To not be negligent? And to have jealous colleagues? Your life is a threat to their work ethic. Your integrity is uncomfortable for them. Your identity as a follower of Christ is convicting. And the workplace can become volatile simply because you want to please Christ. Third sermon. The value of favorable opinions. How valuable is the favor of others toward godly living? Daniel did everything right. He should have been esteemed, and he was. And then he wasn't. The favor is fickle. This may lead to success and high position. It may lead to downfall. And how much value is there in the opinion of men? Not much. Some pastors need to hear this. You answer to the Lord, not to the opinions of men. Small group leaders need to hear this. Listen, people will come to your small group and they'll really enjoy it for a season and then they feel like they've heard everything that you've exhausted in your ability to lead a small group and they go to the next small group. Okay. People come and go. Parents, you need to hear this. Listen, um, your kids will esteem you every once in a while. They'll listen to what you say because they love what you have to say and you've got a proven track record of faithfulness and wisdom and then sometimes they just won't. That doesn't change what we do or what we say. If you're discipling someone and they just don't like what you're bringing, if you're in a crisis discipleship mode, you're counseling somebody and, and you give them a whiff of biblical hope and they say, yes, I want to hold on to that hope. And then they realize that your counsel means that change is hard and slow. I want to move on to something else, move on to someone else's advice. That ought not change what we do and what we say. Students at school sharing the gospel with friends, you don't change your message when it isn't well received. And listen, when you live an exemplary life as a student, you may be esteemed by teachers for a season. And then when the teachers are threatened and indicted by your testimony of Jesus, that favor can go away. But when we don't live for the opinions and favors of men, those things come and go. God's estimation of you matters. And if for a time God gives you favor in the eyes of the world, praise him. And if the world turns against you, that would be normal. Trust him. Sermon number four. There are only 27 of these, so just hang on. Sermon number four. The vulnerability of vanity. The vulnerability of vanity. If you love yourself, you're vulnerable to people who will say they love you as much as you love yourself. Darius was blinded by flattery. He didn't cross-check the lie. It would have been easy to say, you really got all the prefects, all the satraps, 120 of them, all the high officials, and all the governors to agree to this? Really, I know that guy. He, not him. Really, you got everybody? Do the priests at the temple know about this plan? Why are we doing this again? What is this law about? It would have been easy to cross-check their lie. He didn't. He was blinded by flattery. And watch out for flattery. Flattery from manipulation, flattery unto compromise, flattery unto every temptation of every sort. You're vulnerable when you think highly of yourself. And when no one else seems to think highly of you, you are especially vulnerable to that one person who comes along and strokes your ego and says, wow, I just think you're the cat's meow. You're great. And there's strings attached to that. When it comes to temptation, there are deadly strings attached to that. 
someone comes along to tell you you're everything that they have been looking for, that is fertile ground for regrettable choices. Sermon number five, the corrupting influence of corruption. How far will you go to get what you want? These corrupt government officials were willing to murder, to kill a man to get a promotion, to tell a lie to get that done. How did they get there? There is the slippery slope of sin. Fascinating book is the book called Neighbors, and it's the history of the German populace who turned in Jews who were their neighbors to the SS in Nazi Germany. And they were told, see that grand piano right there? You can have that nine foot grand piano and all the jewelry and the cash if you just turn them in. What would greed in the heart do in that situation combined with the lie that you were superior genetically? Turn them in. They're the problem with European society anyway. The, the reason they have all that stuff and the reason I don't have that stuff is because they've been cheats all along. Yeah, turn them in. And the heart goes there so quick. And you look back on the atrocities in Europe in World War II and you think, how could anybody do that? It was normal people who turned in the piano teacher and their mailman and their kid's soccer coach. Staggering. There is a corrupting influence of corruption. You let your heart turn down that road and you'll keep letting it turn. All right, sermon number six, Daniel the courageous. Daniel's courage meant no compromise. Fear of the Lord rather than fear of lions, rather than fear of man, rather than fear of consequences for faithfulness. He counted the cost. Where does that courage come from? In Daniel, confidence in something bigger than his circumstance. I'm afraid of something far scarier than a pit of lions. All right, sermon number seven, Daniel the consistent. Daniel's courage led to no compromise. His consistency led to no compromise. He had built patterns and habits. This was not courage mustered at the critical moment, but consistent conviction as a pattern of life. He had won small battles at the heart level. Look, you can't aspire to the very public fame of a Daniel without cultivating private faith and faithfulness as a pattern over time. Daniel's pattern of noticeable devotion to God meant that nothing changed in his life when the law of the land changed. Babylon was a place ripe for compromise, religious pluralism, moral decadence. Look, it is possible to be surrounded by pollutants, inundated with temptations, and remain unstained. He refrained from Nebuchadnezzar's food in chapter 1. He was not enticed by Belshazzar's trinkets in chapter 5. That gets us to chapter 6. Daniel consistently took care of his heart, of his heart's attractions in little things. This was preparation for the big stage in this chapter. Consistency in faith, hope, prayer, integrity of life, all of that was in place before we get to chapter 6. Alexander McLaren said this about Babylon, luxury, sensuality, lust, self-seeking, idolatry, ruthless cruelty, and the like were the environment in the middle of this, there grew up that fair flower of a character, pure and stainless by the acknowledgement of his enemies, and in which not even accusers could find a speck or spot. There are no circumstances in which a man must have his garments spotted by the world. However deep the filth through which he has to wade, if God sent him there, and if he keeps hold of God's hand, his purity will be more stainless by reason of the impurity around him. Sermon number eight, Daniel the content, Daniel the content. His was a contented reflection on the goodness of God. Daniel was an old guy. He had tasted and seen that the Lord was good. I think about Polycarp. Remember, Polycarp was going to be sacrificed to the lions in the stadium. Polycarp was a firsthand disciple of the Apostle John, so very early church martyr. And and when the emperor 
had him on trial, essentially saying, you're, you're, we're going to feed you to the lions. And you've already seen people getting shredded by these animals. It's not going to be fun. You can get out of it if you just deny Christ. <laughs> What's a lion? And he said, okay, then we're going to put you in the fire. And they built the logs. And they burned him and killed him. He said, these 80 and 6 years have I served my Lord, and he never did me any harm. I cannot deny my Lord and Master now. What great words. A life of watching God's faithfulness in your life produced a confidence that he would be good even as your life expires in the flames. Daniel was content with the goodness of God. And think about his ministry as prophet in the exile. 60 years of statecraft. Getting to that 70-year mark where the Babylonian exile would come to its completion, uh, completion as per the promise from God in Jeremiah 29. And Daniel is, has watched the incubation of God's people in exile being prepared to return to the land. And he's watched God care for his people to protect them, to actually produce a, a life where they could live and thrive and benefit and have children in exile and get back to the land. He has seen the fulfillment and the fruit of his own prophetic ministry in this land, and, and he's seen it for a long time, decades. He's not going to turn his back on God now in his 80s. Okay, sermon number nine. This is the last one this evening. What is this passage about? The sovereign God of Israel will keep his people. The sovereign God of Israel will keep his people. There is only one God, he is sovereign over nature, he's sovereign over nations, he's sovereign over governments of all human history. Every knee will bow, God's people are safe in him. And we see evidences of that already. The exiles, again, were cared for by God in their exile, similar to their incubation and protection in Egypt. They had already gotten favor with the ungodly. Cyrus' new edicts would not only allow them to go back to the land, but actually fund the temple rebuilding. It's similar to the Egyptian plunder. You remember God gave favor to the Israelites in the Egyptian people, and the Egyptians just gave up all their stuff. And think about the fact that God's word remains God's word remained for the people in exile. There is, of course, Daniel the prophet who is a mouthpiece for God in the exile, the book of Jeremiah in Daniel's hands. And then if Daniel is the author of Psalm 119, and I think there's some interesting features here from Daniel chapter 6, uh, a series of very specific vocabulary that also shows up in Psalm 119. You have here the, the promises of God, the written word of God as the basis for obedience and faith, anticipation, clinging to God's promises. All these are here. God is sovereign. He rules human history. That theme throughout the book of Daniel would keep his people theologically in track, in tune with God's purposes, despite the appearances, despite the circumstances that they would feel and face. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are God. You alone are God. There is none like you. There is none to whom we could compare to you. We may not be in the same situation Daniel is in. We do recognize that we have an enemy, an adversary, who is like a lion roaming about the earth seeking someone to devour. We know that nothing can separate us from your love. Nothing can defeat your promises. Nothing can undo your purposes, your plan, your absolute sovereignty over the finite details of all of human history. You are God, and we are your people, and we are so glad to be your people. Let us have the perspective that we've looked at even here this evening. Prepare us for whatever you have for us in store in this land in this administration or the next or the next after it. God, would you prepare our children to be faithful, unstained mouthpieces for you in this world. We ask it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.